show. I am indeed Corey Morgan. I'm back from my breakdown south. I'm rested. I'm full of piss and vinegar. I'm ready to rant, rave, share opinions, interview people, do all that good stuff that I, I do on this show every week at Wednesdays at this time or at different times in the evenings on the Cowboy Network and some of your other favorite cable channels out there. So I do want to start by thanking James Finkbeiner for holding down the fort for the last few weeks while I was hiding out in the desert there. I appreciate it. He did a great job. And of course, Nico was, was supporting him well there as well. So a packed show today as always. I've got Dan McTeague coming on from Canadians for Affordable Energy. We're going to talk about energy. There's lots to talk about all the time. Uh, again, I mean, Alberta's energy rich, yet we seem to have energy shortages. Uh, Alberta's energy rich, yet uh, I paid far less for my fuel while I was driving through the states, even after exchange was put into account, than I pay in Alberta. We should talk about some of these things, because I don't think we're doing a real good job with energy up here. Of course, I'll have my news check-ins and other things going as well. So I see some of the commenters there. Tom Hamilton already in there saying uh, we're going to talk about the recall process. And he's saying it was written by politicians for politicians uh, to give the appearance uh, of, you know, accountability. And he's right. And I agree. And I'm going to talk about that uh, a little more in just a moment here. And E Sharp there throwing a comment in. So for those following the show live, yes, throw those comments in there, questions. I see them all. I won't necessarily read them all out, but I appreciate them. Just keep things civil. So let's talk about recall because it's come up in the news in Alberta quite uh, quite a bit in Calgary due to a, a new uh, petition to recall Mayor Gondek. And I've always been a strong supporter of direct democracy through citizens-initiated referenda and accountability through citizen-led recall initiatives. And Calgary Mayor Jody Gondek is the worst mayor in living memory. She's only halfway through her first term in office, and she's that bad. She's a prime candidate for recall. As voters have realized, Gondek wasn't who she purported to be when she ran for the job. And we're seeing massive buyer's remorse as Gondek lurches from one disaster to another, offending people left and right, while taxes continue to rise. Polls are reflecting a very strong majority of Calgarians want the chance to fire Gondek as soon as possible. But with all that said, the current recall initiative launched against Jody Gondek is doomed to fail and may actually, unintentionally, even help her. I mean, to begin with, the bar to recall a civic po politician is impossibly high. You need over 514,000 signatures from eligible Calgarian voters, and they need to be collected in 60 days to invoke the recall. Anybody who actually thinks this is possible has never actually done real petitioning. It's a slow process and takes a lot of work. To garner half a million signatures in two months would take a massive organizational machine that just doesn't exist out there. And you got to remember, these signatures required aren't digital. They have to be handwritten and witnessed on an official petition sheet with a name, address, and phone number of the person signing so the signature can be verified later. A lot of people aren't going to be comfortable sharing that information with a petitioner, even if they support the cause. Many signatures garnered as well are going to be rejected later because the name or the address might not be legible or the person's residency couldn't be confirmed with the electors lists. The petitions you see are checked when they're submitted. And that means the real number required, if you were going to be realistic, would actually be more like 550, 560,000 signatures. Now, a hardworking, effective petitioner going door to door, a really good one, could get perhaps 100 signatures a day. So think about it. It would take nearly 100 people working full-time hours seven days a week for two months, assuming all those 500 and some thousand are existing out there, to round up the required signatures in time. Coordinating that many workers would require management personnel, transportation, some kind of office to ensure they aren't overlapping territory. They'd need to track where they've been to do second and third rounds in neighborhoods to catch the people who weren't home the first time. I mean, petitioning in public places like malls, events, transit stations, it can be effective, but it won't be enough. It has to be door to door. So to put it in perspective, only 390,000 people even bothered to vote in the last mayoral race. Even if 100% of those people were now opposed to Gondek, you'd still need more than 100,000 on top of all that to sign the petition, and you got to find them to make the recall work. The legislation guiding citizen-initiated referenda isn't much better. The creation of the Recall Act was the final straw, actually, for me when it came to supporting former Premier Jason Kenney. I used to be a strong supporter of his, but that was a cynical nod to those who voted for him based on his campaign of accountability and citizen empowerment. Kenney promised recall and referendum legislation to Albertans, and he purposely crafted, crafted the legislation to make it useless and impossible to invoke, as we're seeing today. He misled people when he promised that legislation. He had no interest in letting citizens hold their elected officials to account. But he didn't hesitate to promise that 
to win the votes in the first place. I just, I despise that kind of bait and switch type of politics. Either support citizens' referenda or don't. But to give this, this garbage legislation to us was a slap in the face to the supporters. So the people behind the petition to recall Gondek, I mean, they're well-meaning, that, that, that fellow who's gotten that going. And I don't doubt I agree with him on almost everything, probably. But the efforts would be better spent putting pressure on UCP MLAs to fix the broken recall legislation. They're the only ones who can do it. Once that's done, then they can get to work on a recall. Otherwise, they're pissing in the wind, guys. You're wasting time and energy. Further, when the petition fails, and it will, Gondek and her few supporters are going to claim it's because Calgarians actually support her. It'll be actually a, a public relations win for the mayor who really hasn't earned a win in her entire time in office. Also, those who signed or worked on gathering the sig signatures for the petition, they're going to have built up cynicism and apathy, and it's going to entrench it more. They're going to be tired. They're going to feel like it was a wasted effort, and they're going to be less inclined to participate in democratic exercises in the future, even if the legislation gets fixed. Look, I hate crapping on good grassroots efforts made by citizens. We need to see more of it, and I admire the gumption among those who have gotten the petition to recall on that going. I got to call it as I see it, however, and it's an initiative that won't lead to a productive outcome. I hope the folks involved redirect their efforts to helping Albertans get the legislation they need. Then they can, and I can, get fully behind those recall efforts against those politicians that have earned those efforts. Until then, though, they're just wasting good shoe leather going out there getting signatures for something that, that that's just not going to change. So either way, sorry to you know, poop on the parade, guys, but it's just not going to go anywhere. All right, let's see what else is going on out there and check in with Mr. Naylor in the newsroom. Hey, Dave, how's it going? Hey, Corey, good. Welcome back. Oh, thanks. Thanks. You know what, uh, that young Finkbeiner guy, he did a pretty good job. I think we had a young star in the making there. Yeah, I think so. No, I was watching it from down south. I can only vacation so much. I still got to see what's going on up here. No, James did great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I am a bit perturbed that you... Uh, you abandoned Duke the Wonder Dog, uh, and you didn't take him on holiday with you. I did. I mean, we were in a fifth wheel for, for 25 days. It's a wonder that Jane didn't strangle me over the course of that time with that much proximity to each other and a big lazy bulldog. If we had that screwy 130-pound Duke in there, uh, it would have been disastrous, I'm afraid. Oh, man. I don't know <laughs> if he'll ever forgive you. He seems to have gotten over it. I gave him some cookies when I got home, and he forgot about everything. Oh, yeah, you're the best now, so... You know what? We've had a really busy uh, morning out here in the newsroom, Corey. We got uh, probably about 15 new stories up uh, already. Right now, we're leaving off with uh, reaction on uh, Conservative leader Pierre Polyev has uh, finally commented on uh, uh, the transgender policy that Alberta is bringing in, and he says he is also against uh, giving puberty blockers to uh, uh, to children. He says they should uh, wait until they're adults. We got some more facts and figures from StatsCan on just the, the massive number of people moving to Alberta, mainly from uh, Ontario and BC to escape their uh, tax regimes. 45,000 people have moved uh, uh, to Alberta recently, so uh, uh, the province is booming. Uh, lots of other stuff, Corey. We've got uh, uh, conservatives trying to fight back against a government increase of $450 a month for Canadian uh, uh, military members. and. You know what, Corey? They don't get paid a lot to begin with. Four hundred and fifty dollars a month uh, rent increase is uh, is a horrible thing uh, to put them through. Uh, we've got our uh, columnist Jaime Rubenstein talking about the uh, ousted uh, BC cabinet minister who was uh, forced to quit uh, this week. Uh, and we've got a Liberal uh, MP, the, the Justice Minister, a Federal Justice Minister, uh, apologized for uh, calling uh, Pierre Polyev a very, very bad word in the uh, in the House of Commons. So we've got that uh, you can uh, check out. And we've got uh, two of my two favorite stories of, uh, of the day are already uh, uh, being punched down the list a bit because of all the other stuff. All those killer whales trapped in the ice in Japan. There was about uh, 12 or 13 of them. Some, uh, some heartbreaking footage yesterday of them all get, trying to squeeze in this little maybe 10 foot square hole in the ice. But uh, it turns out they have, uh, they've managed to escape and uh, now appear to be uh, swimming free. And the uh, Criminal Genius of the Year Award goes to a, uh, uh, an alleged Calgary drug dealer who was uh, handing out his business cards with free little baggies of cocaine attached, free samples of cocaine for, uh, for whoever wanted it. Uh, uh, needless to say, it didn't take uh, Calgary police long to uh, investigate and find him with a whole bunch of drugs. And, uh, uh, and he now got a laundry list of charges. So criminal uh, criminal minds at their best there, Corey. 
Yeah, who'd have seen that coming? Well, I mean, you know, points for uh, ambition, I guess. <laughs> but, I guess, you know, everybody's got to start somewhere. Yeah. Uh, you know, handing out, uh, you know, at least better, better. Uh, he was doing it at a casino, downtown casino. So I guess better a casino than a school. Yes, and uh, just, I guess, uh, a final little bit of news. It looks like our, uh, Jonathan Bradley might be uh, moving along somewhere else. Yes, Jonathan Bradley, our, uh, our crack young reporter, he's being promoted to our uh, legislature bureau. Uh, so he's uh, all excited about that, and he'll uh, he'll be up there for the start of the session on uh, February 28th, holding uh, holding the government's feet to the fire. So uh, he's looking forward to it, and I'm looking forward to it, and he's going to do a great job. Excellent. I'm sure he will. All right. Thanks, Dave. I'll uh, talk to you after the show. Thanks, Corey. So, yeah, that is our, our uh, news editor, Dave Naylor. I see lots of stories always breaking. This is when I like to remind and nag everybody the reason we can do it, the reason we got these stories coming up, we, the reason we're sending reporters all over the place is because you guys have subscribed. We don't take any government cash, guys. We need the subscriptions, and you've come through. If you subscribed already, thank you very much. If you haven't, come on, guys, get on there. WesternStandard.News slash subscription. It's 10 bucks a month, $100 for a year. You know, just like an old newspaper subscription will get you past the paywall and allows us to keep producing these shows and writing those stories that we know the legacy media isn't going to give them to you. And yes, it's going to be good to have uh, feet on the ground in Edmonton at the legislature. We've got an office actually in there. We are, uh, you know, an accredited outlet. Uh, Arthur Green used to be up there, but he got snatched away. And uh, Jonathan's going to be up there. And boy, he's prolific. So there's going to be a lot of fantastic legislative coverage coming out of Edmonton, plus our, our reporters all over the country and columnists. So uh, yeah, quite a bit on the go, guys, and, and lots to keep me busy. So just to get back a bit to that recall again, uh, yeah, the, the fellow, and I want to give him credit, you know, he's been out there, he's, he's been talking to the news, his name's Landon Johnston, and he sounds very genuine, he, he's, you know, upset with, with Gondek, as, as pretty much most Calgarians are, and uh, he's, he's making a his effort, you know, and hey, you know what, if, if he proves me wrong and, and gets hundreds of thousands of signatures and even manages to, you know, come close to uh, invoking the referendum, I'll, I'll, I'll eat the words. But, you know, there's things we could be doing if you want to change things in the meantime. I mean, that legislation needs to be fixed. I think email, phone, nag your MLA and uh, Premier Smith, I mean, she's got a lot on her plate, but just get her to get out there and uh, fix that legislation because they're are formulas that are uh, reasonable for, for, for um, recall. Because, you know, you want a balance. You don't want it too easy. That's fair. You don't want the, the second election is finished, somebody starting a recall initiative and constantly going after whoever won. You don't want it to be constantly on the go. You want it to be in exceptional circumstances when a, a leader is exceptionally bad, a politician is exceptionally bad. And rest assured, as we see from that headline there too, yeah, with Jody Gondek, she is outstandingly terrible. But the, the legislation makes it impossible to utilize, to recall her. But in the meantime as well, because uh, Mr. Johnston's been saying he's had, you know, a lot of volunteers contacting him, and I don't doubt it. And, and people are going to go out. Should be. What you want to do, what you could do then if you've got those volunteers, get out there and do voter ID. Go door to door and find out who is really strongly determined to replace Jody Gondek and get that and list it and database it. You see... The recall petition, you can't use that for anything else. You can't take those names and numbers. And that's what Gondek's already implying. She's implying that the, the data is going to be shared because that'll make people scared to sign as well, scared to commit their name to this initiative and things like that. And, uh, you know, and you're not supposed to use it for anything else, which is fair, right? A person didn't sign to be spammed by other initiatives or things like that. They, they signed that petition with the intent of getting a recall on the go. But you can go, nothing is stopping you from going door to door and doing voter ID. As Daryl, one of the commenters saying, voter turnout's barely breaking 30 to 50% of eligible voters. Yes, so it's unreasonable. Not only that, though, it shows how important voter ID is. So if, if you've gone out and you've gotten thousands and thousands of names of identified anti-Gondek voters, you could share that list with a future person who's running against Gondek in the next election. It's less than two years away now anyway. And that gives them a good base to start with, to get out there and get signs on the ground, to get donations, to get, uh, again, just to get out the vote, to encourage them. It's one thing, for the, one thing for them to say when somebody's coming door to door that they're going to vote for a different mayor. It's another for them to actually get around to doing it. So that's where... Um, Again, you know, the, these efforts could be much better directed. 
Uh, some people are saying, and I, I saw a commenter on my column, I wrote the column, which is my monologue, you know, saying the same sort of thing. Well, I support it. And, and you know, there, there's, there's nothing being lost in doing this, but that's not true. It, it, it's energy, it's time. And uh, if it's not going to accomplish the goal, it, it's being utilized uh, poorly, which, which could have had a better effect. Either way, we could talk about that a lot more, and I'm certain we will. I see my guest has popped into the lobby, and I've been looking forward to it. I haven't had him on in a while, and we've got a lot to cover. So let's uh, welcome back to the show Mr. Dan McTeague of Canadians for Affordable Energy. Hi, Dan. How you doing? I'm doing fine, Corey. Good to talk to you, and uh, thanks for having me here. Oh, I'm always glad to have you on. I just like that reminder as we're getting a little grayer and, and you know, uh, longer in tooth. But the, there was a time when when liberal members of parliament were, were something that could be considered sane and you were of that era. And, uh, you know, maybe we could get back to a balanced parliament again one day. I would still vote conservative, but perhaps I could respect those liberals over there again. And we could respect conservatives on the other side. Uh, I think those days can will come back, but it requir- requires a lot of people to get back to basics and reality and uh, move away from the utopian fantasies we've been entertaining, especially here in Eastern Canada. Yeah, well, I, I love you calling them out on social media, on uh, X and, and other areas as well. You, you say it like it is. But your, your specialty is energy issues. And boy, you know, there's a lot of them going on. Uh, I just came back from, from uh, about 25 days down stateside. I was traveling through Idaho, Arizona, Texas, uh, New Mexico, quite a bit around. And uh, just to, to, to tie this in up here, something is interesting. Maybe you could help a little with. Down there, I saw the most, uh, in the energy producing states, I saw the most windmills, I saw the most solar farms, just like when in Al- I'm in Alberta, I see the most windmills and solar farms, even though there's the abundance of natural resources. Yet both Texas and Alberta have been stricken by energy shortages when push comes to shove. How is it that these jurisdictions are the ones that seem to be the most vulnerable when, when it comes to needed electricity and, and power when, when they should be the least? Well, it's ironic that you have a country in a region of the uh, world, uh, both Texas and the United States, which are the prowess, the uh, the flagships of uh, energy reliability and energy uh, development resource and output and exports. And yet uh, both have found themselves uh, over the years, Alberta very recently, last month, Texas two, three years ago, when uh, putting all your eggs in one renewable basket doesn't necessarily cut the... Uh, cut the mustard when you uh, when you put these things to the test and they were tested in Alberta's case uh, had it not been for the uh, the ability for the province to secure natural gas and to a lesser extent coal a good number of people would have been adversely affected minus 40 or more degree uh, temperatures in the United States we do know that there were uh, there were injuries and potentially fatalities in Texas but those areas that were served by natural gas backups where uh, wind power was simply not available, not reliable, um, we saw that they, they were far more successful in certain areas. And it's become very clear uh, through analysis uh, in the Texas case, I think it was Texas Railroad Commission at the time said, uh, you know, without natural gas backup, uh, the, uh, the idea of uh, windmills are fanciful and dangerous. And I think that's where we're leading today, because I think a lot of the policies promoted by governments on both sides of the border uh, are leading us to uh, really what I consider the uh, net zero collision course in which reality is going to finally hit uh, Canadians and Americans over the head that these things are not ready for prime time. Well, and it does get dangerous and, and frustrating. I, I watched some of the conversation while Alberta was getting hit so hard. That was just as I was kind of heading down south. And, it, you know, we're worried when, it, when it's minus 30 and you get a power failure. I mean, people could be terribly, terribly harmed. But what I'm hearing from the advocates is saying this is an indication on why we need more renewables because we need to bring more power into the grid. Like they, they double down. They, they, they won't face the, the reality that we still need this conventional energy base. Well, look, uh, you have no wind and it's freezing outside. You can have one windmill or 10 million windmills. They're still not going to work if there's no wind. And if you think your economy can be subject to the vagaries of weather and wind and, uh, you know, whether you have enough sun uh, in the winter, which, of course, is not the case in northern parts of this country, you're delusional. And I think it's pretty clear that we have to be able to call these folks out because after billions of dollars, not just in Canada, but uh, in Europe, billions of dollars of investment billions of dollars of walking away and uh, shutting down nuclear plants, shutting down natural gas, turning your back on your ability to frack your own and provide your own, uh, uh, you know, uh, energy. You have to really ask the question, 
now that these things have failed, now that Germany is opening up coal plants, now that Britain is going back to opening up the North Sea for natural gas, now that Italy is going to Libya's doorstep and asking for more oil, if this, if this has been an abject failure, and it's very clear that they are walking away from net zero in Europe as we speak, you only have to look at the another dimension of the uh, protest. That's what farmers are doing in most of the uh, European uh, nations across uh, a, a significant swath. If we don't recognize what's happened in Europe and we continue to ignore at our peril that wind and factors uh, such as extreme weather uh, make uh, rely, renewables unreliable, then I think we are definitely courting disaster. And it's irresponsible for politicians to go out there and say we can do that and replace hydrocarbons. The fact is, most of these renewables are complementary. They complement the existing menu of uh, energies you have. They're not there to substitute or replace. Uh, nothing short of that will, I think, convince people that the law of thermodynamics, and as you said before, physics must apply here. And it's uh, it's the great corrector in all this, Corey. We need to see uh, our, uh, our legislators uh, and those who are making decisions on behalf of the country to get with the program and realize these mandates uh, EV mandates, uh, clean energy regulations, carbon taxes, uh, what's the other one, the EV availability standard, all of these things are, you know, wonderful, utopic ideas, but when subject to reality, the harsh reality of the, of, of the climate in which we live in, they're not ready and they're fundamentally dangerous uh, to our existence in a very cold and very prohibitive country. Yeah, well, we've got an ideologically driven government. I mean, they just won't seem to face reality. I, and when it comes to some of the things in, in trying to force people to convert away from conventional energy sources, I, I see on uh, Black Knox Reporter today, and they're fantastic, of course, they broke with, uh, uh, you know, we, we saw the carbon tax exemption that the Liberals carved out for the Maritimes because they realized they were dropping in support over there. But they said, this is because we're going to switch everybody to heat pumps, though. We just need to, to, to move them over. And they brought in this incentive of a grant of fifth, up to $15,000 to, to move to a heat pump. But the numbers came out, uh, and this has been a, almost a year since they brought in those grants. There have been 80 oil furnaces replaced. 80. I mean, it, it's absurd. But they won't back yeah. off. No, they won't back off because it uh, it is not something they really care about because no one's holding their feet to the fire as far as uh, finances and scrutiny. And you're looking at, look, the, uh, Cape Breton, <laughs> buried in 100 centimeters of snow. Many of those heat pumps do not work in that kind of circumstance. I'm not going to dump on people with heat pumps, especially if they're, you know, they got them for a reason because they thought it was free or the government's out there. But it's irresponsible to say the least. To to assume that uh, you can uh, you can put those heat pumps in and uh, and have a great life. The reality is that uh, don't take my word for it. No insurance company in this country is going to give you uh, coverage if you only have a heat pump as a means of uh, keeping your home more warm. You have to have an alternative source. Rather than worrying about the alternative, rather than trying to be cute and trendy, maybe we stick with what works, continue to improve that. We've done so in the case of heating. We've done so in the case of, of automotive uh, efficiencies. I mean, the internal combustion engine mated with a hybrid, mated with, a, uh, you know, taking away real pollution as we did 50 years ago with the, uh, with the use of uh, uh, catalysts on, on vehicles, catalytic converters. These are technologies that are game changers, but they will continue to allow us to recognize that fossil fuels are going to be here for a very long time, well past our existence for all of us who are here today and born as of this day forward. Oh, yeah. I mean, the Hyundai I drive today, I mean, the mileage it gets compared to the old Cutlass I used to drive around at the end of the 80s. I mean, it, you can't even compare the two of them anymore, but it still needs gasoline. I, I, I'm not getting around that. It's the most efficient uh, means for me. Kind of getting, bringing things back to a little more. I mean, something you've been helpful with, too, and a, and a lot of you did in the past, though, in the short game. I mean, we've had very volatile uh, energy prices in Calgary for whatever reason. I guess just last night, gasoline prices went up 12 cents a liter. Uh it, it pays for people to shop around, though, and watch for these things. I mean, if you saw that coming, perhaps you could have filled the car up yesterday before this hit. Uh, what are the reasons for these spikes going on? Well, look, I tweeted that on uh, Friday. I said, folks, get ready. It's going to go up 10 cents a liter plus, more or less, because I can't determine how much a, a gas retailer is going to charge as far as their margin is concerned. But I warned people. I also put it up on gaswizard.ca, the site I operate. Um, and no takers, uh, no, certainly no, none of the mainstream media took uh, interest in it until it actually happened, at which point I got 
one and you're the second media that's actually called me on it. I suspect that they probably don't want to hear the fact is that we're paying a lot more than we ought to because the federal government uh, has destroyed the, uh, in many respects, scuppered the value of the Canadian dollar. That's adding 20 cents a litre of gasoline. Of course, the carbon tax at 14.31 cents a litre. So between the two of them, that's an extra 30, 35 cents a litre. I don't think a lot of people would be complaining if we're paying a buck a litre. But the reason is simple. One of the refineries, the biggest one in the U.S. Uh, Midwest, the BP Whitting plant in Indiana went down with a power failure. There's a fire in it. They didn't have backup. So they uh, they relied on the grid, electricity it went down, caused some damage. And that uh, caused a short uh, temporary supply uh, problem, if you will, uh, on the gasoline side. We're still going to see another two cent wholesale price increase come tomorrow. Diesel, we're still not out of the woods yet. That uh, jumped five cents a liter, which you'll see at most gas stations eventually passed on, uh, whether you're in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta or, or BC's interior. Well, there you go. So, I mean, there's that, that good sense just to let all you viewers and listeners remember, you see, Dan told you so. So keep <laughs> an eye on him. I mean, you, you can't predict everything. You can't stop everything. But sometimes you can see that coming down the pipe and maybe you can kind of stock up a little and save a few bucks because budgets are tight right now for most people. I mean, these are not the best of times. And that was something frustrating when I crossed the border into the States as well. I, I mean, I was driving through Arizona that, you know, has next to nothing for, for uh, oil and gas uh, uh, resources yet when I even with the bad Canadian dollar when I would do the conversion I was still paying a good 20 to 30 cents a liter less for fuel there than I do in Alberta when I can see an oil pump every time I look to the left or the right yeah look a couple of things to keep in mind and that's the big one uh, because uh, as a country we've accepted the blocking of pipelines as policies and frustrating our resources from getting to the market no one wants to buy a Canadian dollar it's nothing trade with we're not an interesting company else of course we're talking about housing and we know that there's a lot of questions now emerging as to how the housing bubble occurred. But beyond that, the real danger in Canada is the fact that uh, we don't have a lot of uh, interest in, our, in, in what we have. And therefore, our currency takes a beating. 135 pennies to buy a U.S. dollar. Corey, I don't want to just talk about gasoline. Let's talk about every commodity that we use in this country is priced in U.S. dollars, whether it's made here or not. So when people go around scratching their heads saying, oh, uh, food prices are up or the cost of housing and materials up. Well, you know, there's a good reason for that. It's because by blocking pipelines and making Canada an uninteresting place to invest in particular, you have a weak Canadian dollar. Then, of course, you have a carbon tax on top of that. And you have other taxes, federal and provincial. But that makes up the main difference between ourselves and the United States. And uh, very frustrating. And to, to talk about it, my previous job working a few years in the United States with Gas Buddy, I saw the Americans building out their pipelines, pushing their, 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 uh, their energy sector under the previous administration, while Canada sat back and allowed a group of international fanatics to basically hogtie our resources. And as a result, you and I and everybody who's complaining about inflation today have really known to blame, but those who thought it was cool and acceptable. There is a cost for these things, and if people don't want to smarten up, well, they're going to wind up with uh, uh, having to make some choices about whether it's going to be able to eat or heat or be able to afford your mortgage, much less your rent. Well, and I mean, it's going to feel like forever, but eventually, somehow... Justin Trudeau and, and his henchman Gilbo will be replaced. Either it'll be a new lib liberal leader in power or a, a new government with a new party in power. What will that new administration have to do to try and uh, shore up this trend of, of just high expenses, even though we're a high resource uh, uh, producer? Well, we have to stop spending in certain areas. I mean, gifting and grifting all of these climate organizations that get 30, 50 million bucks. That's the Climate Institute, the Canadian Climate Institute, 30 million. They got 20 million a few years ago. They don't raise a lot of money. Their work is to advocate their stuff, which is basically go around to governments, tell them how to give them more money, print more money and give us more money so that we can go out and advocate even more damage to the Canadian economy without an iota of change to the so-called climate. Uh, we have to look at the reality that net zero and all of its 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 out its outshoots its uh, its policies uh, is uh, is likely to lead to a significant deterioration in our economic uh, outlook uh, if we don't address that. And I'm not talking about delaying EV mandates and delaying carbon taxes and delaying the clean fuel standard and delaying a cap on only oil and gas, which we know is discriminatory, and a cap on production. We need to look at net zero line it up on the 30 yard line and punt it right through the end zone because we don't do it then canadians are have to make a decision about the quality of life that they want if anybody believes for a moment that we can do without oil and gas physically uh and and hydrocarbons 
good luck with that. There isn't a single thing that we use or consume that doesn't have a component of that within it. And if we think we can do without 20 to 30 billion bucks in revenues, for the federal, provincial and municipal governments, yes, the municipal governments cash in on that as well. You're dreaming technicolor. And the last thing people like that should be is in politics. They shouldn't be in the House of Commons. We need reality back into politics. And I'm hoping that at least one leader seems to be showing promise in that area. I still have to prod him. But I think Paul, Pierre Polyev will make an excellent prime minister. But I can tell you, to undo the damage that's been done by uh, uh, by the coterie of fanatics who've been in there for a long time it won't uh, won't happen overnight. No, it is going to take some time. Well, all we can do is keep pushing and and uh, studying and trying to inform people and, and hope we can turn that tide. And that's what you've been doing a lot of. So before I let you go, uh, where can people find what, what you've been doing, Dan, and, and you know what you put out there? Yeah, the work that I'm doing is can always be found at uh, uh, affordableenergy.ca. That's really the best place to sign up if you can, and I appreciate you asking that. As for gas price predictions, gas price wizard. Um, and of course, if you have some opinions, I don't mind sharing them with you on X, and uh, we may agree or disagree, as long as, of course, you're prepared to tell me who you are. You're not a troll. Uh, but I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. But uh, for those out there who want to get in a bit of a, a battle, no problem. I'll, I'll do it up to a point. Excellent. Well, I appreciate the work you do, Dan, and, and uh, I appreciate you coming on to talk to us again. Uh, keep up the good work, and, and I hope we get to talk again soon. My pleasure. Looking forward to that, Corey. Take care. All right, thanks, Dan. So yeah, this is Dan McTeague of uh, Canadians for Affordable Energy, and I said he's a, a great resource online, and he likes to debate. He, he's fun on X. Uh, you know, it's not necessarily big, deep policy discussions on there, but you can uh, interact and, and uh, cover some ground. I mean, it, it's not necessarily... Uh, uh, a waste when you're you're on there. You know, so something we talked about, and it's a column I'm going to have coming out a little later in this week. I talked about, you know, observational things I see, stuff I saw when I was traveling. And uh, when, when when Dan was sort of touched on it, he, he talked about how the Americans have, uh, you know, developed their oil. They've expanded it. While we're in Canada, we're, we're kicking ourselves in the knackers collectively and shutting in our resources, which costs us on every level. It costs on resources for... Uh, uh, governments at every level, and it costs economically. And the number I looked up just to double check. So when you look at the, and there's a lot of things that contribute to that, but a, a real measure of a national wealth is the GDP per capita, gross domestic product per capita. You know, how much product, how much activity, what is happening economically per person in that country. And in the United States, the GDP per capita is over $70,000 American. It doesn't mean the average income is that. It just means that much you know, economic generation. In Canada, that number is 52000 per person American. Way lower. Considerably lower. Meanwhile, you can buy a big, fine house in an economic powerhouse city like Houston... For two or three hundred thousand dollars in Canada, in any major city, you can't get anything under six hundred thousand. Or if you're going to be in Toronto or Vancouver, you're looking over a million. So you're getting less money with more expensive consumer products. Likewise with the fuel, right? We're paying more for the fuel, but we have less in our pockets to do so. The difference is just so stark, and it's a difference in attitude. It's a difference in culture. And what I wrote about was. What I saw, I mean, I put on 4,000 miles. I can still use miles with, with Jane while we traveled in the fifth wheel. I, took, I like driving. I, I do my long road trips. It's my old oil-filled past. I don't mind doing it. And I did a lot of American work in the past. And we went all the way down through northern Idaho and then Utah and Arizona, and New Mexico, Texas, all the way back up through Colorado. We covered 10 states in the last few weeks. And we were mostly on interstate highways. The interstate system, I just see it as a symbol of efficient, can-do capitalism on the part, even though it's, you see, we're talking capitalism, we're talking government-built infrastructure, but it's government-built infrastructure to facilitate the trade of goods and services and the movement of private individual people. So Eisenhower had a lot of foresight. I'll give him that post-World War II. They had a lot of soldiers. They needed something to do. They built that system through, throughout the United States, and it's amazing. I mean, you've got divided highway where you can go as fast as 85 miles an hour in some areas. I couldn't with the fifth wheel, but I mean, if you had a car, you could. It's The rest stops 
you know, again, you, you drive to Alberta, you go to a rest stop, it's a garbage can on the side of the highway where four people can park. I went to a rest stop in New Mexico, and it was a tourist destination almost with, with modern sculptures, heated washrooms, like spotless, lots of parking, uh, a dog park, you name it. And it's typical because they want to encourage people to travel. They want to encourage and make it easy and cost effective to move around that country. So those interstates crisscross the country all over the place. You don't hit stoplights. I came in from the south on I-15, finally, you know, back into Alberta at Coots. And uh, the, the difference was just stark. I'm still on a divided highway, but then I go into Lethbridge, and I got a bunch of traffic lights, and I'm going 50 kilometers an hour, and the truckers are all backed up. There's no truck stocks, no gas stations. It's garbage. And uh, it's like that everywhere. But that's because we don't value commerce. We don't look at that. We don't look at that long term as to why we should be developing our country. A lot of goods and services, goods anyways, are transported. Truckers actually travel on the interstate south of the border to get across the continent. You know, it could be a Canadian delivery. It could hit Vancouver, go south, drive through the states, and then come back up and deliver in Toronto because it's not worth driving that crappy Trans-Canada Highway. And it is crappy, guys, when you compare it to an American interstate. There's some nice stretches of the highway but you still get stuck in Regina driving through a business district and go, slowing down and stopping. It doesn't have those rest stops. It doesn't have the truck stops. I mean, there was a truck, truck stop we hit in Wyoming that it was like a resort. It had leather chairs with a, a, a fireplace where you could sit and drink your coffee. And there were like five different businesses serving food and coffee in this stop. The Americans just have a much better attitude with these things. In Canada, we seem to love mediocrity. Oh, we wouldn't want to do that. We wouldn't want to divide it. Then more people would drive. Yes. You know what they would drive besides their vehicles? They would drive the economy. And you would get tourists, more tourists, because people don't want to endure the slow stop and start expensive travel that we have right now. But if it was nice and smooth like that, yeah, they'd be more inclined to do it. More truckers would be inclined to stay up here. The goods and services would move faster. They would burn less fuel. Your costs of those goods and services would go down. We can't do that here. That's not the Canadian way. We spend our money instead on, you know, social justice initiatives and uh, uh, giving money to other countries and things like that. Uh, LC saying no more foreigners. You know, that's getting a little too broad. I, I, I understand. So we do have another issue that's going on in Canada. It's a big one and not enough people are talking about, but some are starting. We are bringing in way too many immigrants. Now, going to zero, that's just stupid. If you want to castrate the economy and, uh, and really harm Canada, uh, drop immigration to zero. That's not reasonable. It's not smart. And uh, it's not a good idea. But we also don't want to be bringing in over a million people a year the way we are as it is. Uh, as, uh, you know, said, yes, you know, way too many. We've got to get it down to a reasonable level. When you get back to that GDP per capita I was talking about, that's part of why we are falling in that. Even though the Americans, again, they got a lot of challenges. It's not a perfect country by any means. And they've got masses of Ill illegal immigrants coming, of course, across the Mexican border. But even then, their GDP per capita is far outpacing ours. And as we bring more people in, we split more the, the resources we have among more people. I mean, and they contribute. Immigrants contribute. They work. They come in. They bring funds with them. They aren't all coming in broke. They bring in education. They bring in skilled labor. It's good for the country. But you can only have, bring them in at a speed with which you can absorb and, 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 and integrate properly. And we're not doing that. We've gone beyond that. We don't have enough health care access right now. We don't have enough housing, of course, right now. And finally, some people are just facing that reality to start talking about at least tapping the brakes. We're not talking about ending immigration or, or coming down on those who are coming here. Hey, good for them. I appreciate it. They're coming here to work and they're doing us a lot of good. But we've got to get the numbers into reality. And reality just doesn't seem to be a priority of this government. It just has not been. And that's what Dan was talking about. And it's going to take, even if uh, we change the government, and even if, if Polyab turns out to be as good as we all hope he is, it's going to take him some time to undo the terrible damage that years of this ideologically driven government have done. And uh, yeah, I mean, Polyab, you know, speaking of watching him battling with the media again today, they're screaming at him and getting on his case because, uh, yeah, he was being a bit belligerent and answering their questions with questions because, of course, they're always trying to play gotcha with them. The legacy media outlets are activist media outlets because they're all beholden on government dollars. Trudeau bought the media. Let's just face it. They're also subsidy dependent that they want to do the bidding of 
the prime minister so they can keep getting those dollars, even if unconsciously. So they're on Polyev's case. It's funny, when they get upset with Polyev because he'll eat an apple when somebody's trying a loaded, stupid question at him, or he'll call out at a reporter when they throw a loaded, stupid question at him, and they do all the time. Do they ever call out Justin when he feeds them word salad? When they ask a direct question and he gives platitudes? When the prime minister is asked about something straightforward that just needed a yes or no, and he answers with something that isn't even related to what they ask, but they don't get on his case like they do with Polyev. You know, there's an irony. Talk about the media, if it's going to take on some role, some ideological role as reporters, not necessarily take on a bias, but a mandate to feel like you're holding the government or elected officials accountable. That's what a lot of reporters pride themselves. Is that's what I'm doing. I'm holding these public officials accountable. Well, right now, they seem to be all focused on holding the official opposition accountable and giving a pass to the Prime Minister Dingbat, who has a lot of things he needs to be held accountable for. Yesterday, he only made it 11 minutes in the House of Commons before he scrambled out of there fast as hell because the questions were getting too hot for him because he can't think on his feet. We know that. He's not exactly a luminary, guys. He's got nice hair. So the media should try and hold him accountable. They don't. They don't. And why did he go running, hightailing out of the, the parliament? Well, because the questions were coming around about, yes, we're getting all the way back to last fall's brilliant, international, embarrassing Canadian issue where those pecker heads brought a literal Nazi, a literal Nazi. Everybody calls everybody a Nazi all the time, all over the place. No, this was a guy who served in the Waffen SS with Ukraine and welcomed him to the House of Commons, applauded him an SS member. And then they threw the speaker under the bus when it was discovered. You know, of course, because we look like fools. Uh, so the speaker lost his job. He's out. But now the news just broke. Well, no. <laughs> Actually, it was the prime minister's office was very tied into this whole thing. Uh, Justin doesn't want to answer those questions. And you know what? No, I, I, I doubt Trudeau himself invited that Nazi, though who knows? Who knows? If he did, the, the, the thing is, I could give him the credit of the ignorance because we know, again, he's not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Unless World War II was laid out in a pop-up coloring book, he wouldn't have the intellectual depth and knowledge of history to know that if somebody was fighting in the war in Ukraine in that time period uh, against the Soviets, because that's what they knew, uh, it's a Nazi. Justin didn't know that. But I mean, it doesn't matter. He's in charge, right? When it says PMO, and I know they're just pushing the blame all over the place, that's prime minister's office. Even if he was ignorant of what the office did, the buck should stop with him. But nobody holds him accountable. He runs away. Yesterday, he ran away. It was cowardly looking. As some others have pointed out, yeah, he seems stunned. He's been bizarre lately, more bizarre than usual. And uh, he just doesn't seem with it. And he was never all that with it to start with. So why are the media silent on that? Again, well, who's paying a lot of their bills, right? We'll call them out, that's for sure. So again, yeah, getting back to that. So, I mean, let's talk about the, the, the temperature. Dave mentioned this too. Uh, in Parliament, things are getting heated. It gets that frustration going back and forth. Attorney General uh, Arif Varani uh, apologized, I guess, because he, he shouted uh, uh, things in the House of Commons uh, with some swears. Uh, he, I think he called Polyev an effing tool. You know, <laughs> I don't know. I... I, I it's unparliamentary, uh, parliamentary, and it's 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 not dignified. It's not a good uh, example of presenting yourself in the in a legislature or House of Commons. Uh, it's not the end of the world either. This stuff's been going on. You know, people always talk about, oh, this is the worst ever. Oh, it's so adversarial, guys. It's always been that way. Always read your history. Look at even some of the exchanges from Sir John A. Macdonald. Uh, you know, you can look up some of those things. He was drunk half the time, not saying that we should always give a pass to vulgarity and things like that. He's not doing himself any favors, this minister, when he did that. And he had to apologize. But I mean, I can't get on a high horse. Anybody who reads my Twitter feed knows that I'm far from a uh, avoiding expletives uh, to drive my points home on a regular basis. This isn't the biggest story of the year, but it's, it's still worth noting and I guess almost laughing about in a, in a, in a sense. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, just another thing going on. Uh, if you remember back when Ralph Klein was in 
uh, in office in Alberta, uh, the parliament was full of fireworks all the time. And, and it was back when Cretchen and Mulroney were going to. It was never civil. That's why these places, I mean, it's an adversarial environment. They're facing each other. They're across from each other. They get lathered and worked up. And the irony is, if you actually get to one of these legislatures, after all that performance and theater, they'll often share the same tables at the cafeteria and chat with each other. Often they are also at each other's throats as much as it would sound like. But uh, it's not the, the biggest... Uh, you know, affair of the year. And uh, yeah, finally, you know, speaking of capitalism, I said that guy walking around Calgary at a casino giving out samples of his cocaine. You know, I, funny, I just started watching a series, I think it was Griselda, uh, talk, you know, and it shows it's about a, a Coke dealer way back in the late seventies, early eighties, who was starting to break into the market of the rich by getting, giving them all free, free Coke, getting them to learn to like it and then becoming good customers later. I'm wondering if that's what happened to inspire this dingbat. Uh, don't, uh, get too wound up in watching Netflix hammerhead. Uh, it's still illegal to distribute cocaine. And, uh, when you're giving it out for free, people will catch up and get you, but whatever, at least, you know, criminals, yeah don't tend to be the smartest ones. That's why they end up getting elected office instead. All right. Well, that's what I've got for this week, guys. We covered a bit of ground, lots of stuff breaking, lots of stuff going on. Uh, be sure to follow us on those channels. You know, do all the like and follow, share us. We can beat the legacy media, guys. We can outperform them. So I appreciate your support in doing that. You know, follow me on uh, X, Corey B. Morgan. You can interact with me there. Watch the pipeline. That's going to be coming out tonight with a few of us breaking down some more of those issues. And be sure to go to the Western Standard to get all your news as it's breaking. Thank you very much for joining me. I'm happy to be back from my vacation and I will see you all again next week at this time. Canadian Shooting Sports Association. Without the CSSA, our gun rights would have been taken long, long ago. These guys are on the front lines helping to draft smart and intelligent firearms regulations and legislation in Canada. And more importantly, educating the public about how we keep guns out of the hands of the wrong people. You become a member, it's absolutely worth every penny.